Hi, this is Elizabeth Shoho Tapuan. Again, I'm uh, continuing this blog that I'm doing to promote the, the Trinity Cares for all of us. They want us to be healthy in all aspects of our lives. We only just have to keep on believing, asking, talking to them. Just talk, talk, talk. You know, and uh, put out our our lives to them because they are our God. You know, uh, they know us more than anybody else. Nobody in the world. He's that they are our creator. And they've given us everything we need. We have in order to love them, go to them, and depend on them. And so basically they're our life. You know, they are everything. Because our life here is temporary. We just don't know when our time is up. So we better do what they are prompting us to do. Because you don't want to live this life Uh, displeasing them because in the end our goal is to be with them in paradise so anyway today I'm talking about uh, Galatians 2 so let us learn what Jesus is conveying here what's the message for you and me you know listen to it chapter 2 14 years later I went up again to Jerusalem this time with Barnabas I took Titus along also I went in response to a revelation and set before them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles but I did this privately to those who seemed to be leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might remain with you. As for those who seemed to be important, Whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearance. Those men added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had been to the Jews. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then? that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs. We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, 
know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Background on Galatians. And of Paul. He has been pushed and challenged, and when he's writing this book, he is angry. So why is he so upset? Paul is writing this book toward the end of his first missionary journey, where he focused mostly on the region of southern Galatia. For close to two years, he had traveled through the area where he proclaimed the good news about Jesus, planted many churches, and lived out the power of the Holy Spirit. This missionary journey marked the beginning of a major transition in the church. For the first time, countless Gentiles became followers of Jesus. But despite all of Paul's successes, he has gone through some pretty intense persecution, including once where he received a public stoning, to the point where they thought he was dead. But that isn't why Paul is angry in this letter. He's angry because a group of false teachers have been coming in behind him and undoing a lot of the hard work that he had done. They were leading these Galatian churches astray. So, who were these false teachers and what was it that they were teaching? To understand the situation better, let's look back at the close and yet complex relationship between Christianity and Judaism and how they each viewed a group we know as Gentiles. In the first century, Judaism viewed Gentiles as unclean sinners and contact with them was unacceptable. Because of this, Jews would keep a distance to them so as not to become unclean themselves. However, there was a provision for Gentiles who recognized the God of Israel and who wanted to worship Him, but it wasn't easy. These Gentiles needed to commit fully to the Jewish lifestyle. What did this mean? This meant that they needed to first be baptized, then the males would need to get circumcised, and then they would need to follow the laws of Moses, especially the food laws and the festivals. These requirements were too much for many Gentiles, so very few fully converted to Judaism. Some Gentiles, however, took a middle way. They recognized the God of Israel and were baptized, but didn't want to go through with the circumcision requirement. These Gentiles were called God-fearers, and though they attended synagogues and were friendly toward the Jews, from a Jewish perspective, they were still considered unclean. This all changed with Jesus. After his death and resurrection, the disciples of Jesus were empowered by the Holy Spirit to boldly proclaim his message to everyone around them. They understood that Jesus was the promised Messiah and Savior of Israel, and that he was the one to whom everything in the Old Testament was ultimately pointing. Jesus had now set them free from the burden of following the sacrifices and the ceremonial works of the law of the Old Covenant. The only thing required to make things right with God was faith in Jesus. These first Christians were Jewish, and initially they only thought to proclaim this good news of their Messiah to other Jews. After all, they had been waiting for the Messiah to come for a long time. Through their proclamation of the good news about Jesus, Many Jews were convinced that Jesus was the Messiah and became Christians. Unfortunately, the majority refused to accept Jesus as their Messiah. They chose instead to continue to follow their Old Testament laws and traditions rather than become followers of Jesus. With that, things between Jews and Christians started to become tense, but there was one thing that made it even greater. God began calling the Christians to do something bold and completely countercultural to bring the good news about Jesus to the Gentile world. As they stepped out in faith and obedience, many Gentiles became followers of Jesus and joined their community of believers. As time went on, so many accepted the faith that Gentiles were starting to outnumber Jewish believers in the church. 
as more Gentiles became Christians, some of the Jewish Christians started to become upset. Even after they became followers of Christ, they continued to hold to their traditional Jewish view of keeping themselves separate from Gentiles. Now they were to just accept them? What would the rest of their Jewish community think? They feared that they might get rejected or even persecuted for being too friendly toward Gentiles. So what did they do? Out of fear, they compromised the gospel message. They decided that faith in Jesus alone was not enough to have a right relationship with God. They taught that righteousness before God was earned through faith in Jesus plus doing the works of the law. They required Gentiles who wanted to become followers of Jesus to go through all the Jewish laws of conversion. In other words, Gentiles must convert to Judaism first in order to become followers of Jesus. This is why these false teachers are called the circumcision group or Judaizers. So what did these Judaizers do next? After Paul had planted a church in a city and then moved on to the next location, they would come in after him and attack Paul's credibility. They claimed that he was not even a true apostle, but was a false teacher who taught them an incomplete gospel message. They accused him of proclaiming an easy gospel to the Gentiles for the sake of getting a lot of converts. However, he was leaving them as unclean God-fearers. The Judaizers would then teach this new church what they called the real gospel message, what Paul didn't tell you. They had a strong influence in some of these early churches, turning new Christians to what Paul in this letter calls a different gospel. So why was Paul angry? Because Jesus had given the Galatians the greatest gift in the world. They were justified through faith in him and they were throwing it all away. They were trying to earn his favor through fruitless works rather than accepting the one and only path to salvation. Now that you know some of this background and how the Judaizers were compromising the gospel message, how does it help you when you now read the book of Galatians? What is Paul's message to the Galatians? And how do we live that message out today? When we truly learn to stand firm in our faith and walk in the freedom God has for us, this is the Galatians effect. It was created by different Christians, pastors, for us to understand more, to uh, appreciate our belief in Jesus and it's life changing, it's life transforming. So let's see this version. ...in the region of Galatia, where Paul had traveled on one of his missionary journeys. You can read the stories in the book of Acts. He wrote this important letter from a place of deep passion and frustration. Here's the backstory. Christianity began as a Jewish messianic movement in Jerusalem, but its message was for all humanity, and so it quickly spread beyond Israel. By Paul's time as a missionary, there were as many non-Jews as there were Jewish people in the Jesus movement, and this sparked a huge debate that we know about from the book of Acts chapter 15. Historically, the covenant people of God were focused in one ethnic group, Israel, and they were set apart by the practices commanded in the Torah, like circumcision of males, eating kosher, observing the Sabbath. And there were many Jewish Christians who believed that for all of these non-Jews to truly become a part of God's family, they needed to obey the laws of the Torah. And so some of these Jewish Christians ended up coming to the Galatian churches. They were undermining Paul and demanding circumcision of all these male non-Jewish Christians. And so many of them were. And when Paul found out, he was brokenhearted and angry. And this letter is the result. He first challenges the Galatians with his summary of the gospel message about the crucified Messiah. He then argues that this gospel is what creates the new multi-ethnic family of Jesus and Abraham. And then he shows how this gospel is what truly transforms people by the presence and power of the Spirit. He opens by expressing his bewilderment that the Galatians have embraced a different gospel. It's the one promoted by these Christians who badmouth Paul and demand circumcision. So Paul first defends the authenticity of his message and authority as an apostle. He was commissioned by the risen Jesus himself to go to the non-Jewish world. Remember the story from the book of Acts. Paul says it was only later that he went to Jerusalem to consult the other apostles like Peter or James. And when he told them he wasn't requiring non-Jewish Christians to be circumcised or eat kosher, they were in full support. 
But this tension ran deeper. Peter had come to Antioch to visit and see all of these non-Jewish Christians, and he was eating and mingling with them. But when some of this Jerusalem opposition group showed up in Antioch, Peter caved under their pressure. He stopped eating with these uncircumcised Christians, and he was avoiding them. And so Paul confronted and accused Peter of hypocrisy, of not staying true to the gospel. For Paul, demanding these new Christians to become circumcised and Torah observant, it's wrong-headed for all kinds of reasons. First of all, because it's a betrayal of the gospel. Or in his words, people are not justified by the works of the Torah, but rather by the faith of Jesus the Messiah. And we have faith in the Messiah Jesus. To be justified, or literally to be declared righteous, it's a rich Old Testament term for Paul. It's when God declares that someone is in a right relationship with him. They're forgiven, they're given a place in God's family, and they are being transformed by God's grace. And it's Paul's conviction that no one can be justified by observing the commands of the Torah, but only by the faith of Jesus. This is a dense phrase, and it could refer to Jesus' own faithfulness in living and dying on our behalf, or it could refer to our own trust and devotion to Jesus. Either way, the point is clear. People are justified only through trusting in what God did for them through Jesus, not by what they do for themselves. At the heart of Paul's gospel is this claim, that when people trust in the Messiah Jesus, what's true of him becomes true of them. His life, death, and resurrection become theirs. Or in his words, I've been crucified with the Messiah, and it's not I who come back to life, it's the Messiah living in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so the reason anyone can say that they are right with God or belong to Jesus' covenant family, it's not because they obeyed the laws of the Torah. It's only because of what Jesus did for them that they could never do for themselves. Now, this profound understanding of what Jesus accomplished, it has huge implications for who can now be included in God's covenant family and for what it means to live as a member of that family. So Paul first turns to the stories about Abraham in Genesis, how he was justified or declared righteous before God by simply having faith, by trusting in God's promise that one day all nations would find God's blessing through him and his offspring. God's purpose was always to have one large multi-ethnic family of people who relate to him on the basis of faith, not on the laws of the Torah. But that raises an important question. Why did God give the laws of the Torah to Israel then? Here Paul offers a very brief and dense explanation that he will later fill out in his letter to the Romans. He observes that the laws of the Torah were given to Israel at Mount Sinai long after God's promise to Abraham. And if you read the Torah carefully, he says, you'll see that God always intended the laws to be a temporary measure. He says the laws had both a negative and a positive role. Negatively, the laws acted like a magnifying glass on Israel's sin. They exposed how Israel shared in the sinful human condition, constantly rebelling against God's law. And so the law, which is good, ended up pronouncing Israel guilty and all humanity with them. Or in his words, the laws imprisoned everyone under the power of sin. But the laws also had a positive role. They acted like a strict school teacher that kept Israel in line until the coming of the promised offspring of Abraham, the Messiah. And once the Messiah came, he fulfilled the purpose of the laws on Israel's behalf. Jesus was the faithful Israelite who truly loved God and neighbor. And as Israel's king, he died to take the curse and consequence of Israel's failure into himself and bring redemption. And so now through Jesus, the offspring of Abraham, God's blessing can come to all people regardless of their ethnicity, social status, or gender. For Paul, requiring Torah observance from non-Jewish Christians, it makes no sense. It's acting as if Jesus didn't fulfill God's promise or deal with our sins. It neglects the new freedom gained for us through Jesus and the gift of the Spirit, and it limits God's promise and blessing to one ethnic family. But, Paul's opponents might argue, the laws of the Torah, they're a proven guide to living according to God's will. How will non-Jewish Christians learn this? Paul responds in chapters 5 and 6 by describing how Jesus' transforming presence through the Spirit is the key. The laws of the Torah are good. They're wise, Paul says. In fact, they can all be summarized, as Jesus did, in the command to love your neighbor as yourself. But the laws, good as they are, they did not give Israel the power to obey them. 
In contrast, the good news is that Jesus did fulfill the laws on our behalf, and now he lives in us through the Spirit, making his people into new humans who fulfill the law by loving others. So Paul goes on to contrast this old and new humanity. The habits of the old humanity are obvious. These are behaviors that dehumanize people, they destroy relationships and whole communities. And while the laws of the Torah prohibited these behaviors, Jesus actually put them to death on the cross. So when a person trusts in Jesus and lives in dependence on the Spirit, his life becomes theirs and produces what Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. This is Jesus' way of life that he wants to reproduce in his family so that they become people of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But this fruit isn't automatic, Paul says. It requires cultivation just like real fruit. Or in his words, if we live by the Spirit, we have to keep in step with the Spirit. This requires intentionality. We have to learn how to prune off our old habits and cultivate new ones. And as we do so, we find ourselves carried along by the Spirit as Jesus reshapes our minds and hearts and makes us into people who love God and others. And in this way, Jesus' people fulfill what Paul calls the Torah of the Messiah. In the end, Paul concludes, this requirement for Christians to become Torah observant or be circumcised, it's an adventure in missing the point. What really matters is God's new creation, this new multi-ethnic family of the Messiah, people full of faith in Jesus who are learning to love God and others in the power of the Spirit. And that's what the letter to the Galatians is all about. Do this. Well, I'm just enjoying this, you know. Because I'm learning, I'm getting, I hope you're getting the message for your life. I'm getting message for mine. And the, the sick child stops eating for days. That isn't good. But at least you have 20 to 30 days to try and help the child before it dies. If someone stops drinking, it's even worse because now you only have two or three days. But if someone is lying on the ground no longer breathing, you have absolutely no time to waste and have to begin CPR immediately in order to revive them. The Apostle Paul does just that when he learns what's going on with the Galatians. While he typically would dictate his letters, in this case he himself takes up the pen and writes his fingers to the bone. Why? You'll find out in Galatians. Galatians consist of three parts. The first part authority, second part salvation, and the third part sanctification. First, maybe a short recap. Galatia is a region in the present day Turkey. This is important because it's not in Israel. And the Galatians did not actually come from this region, but from today's France. So, real goals. That's not important, but it's just interesting. So the Apostle Paul visited this region and preached the gospel there. How that happened you can read in Acts, and what he preached you will learn in Romans. Namely, how God, through the blood and atonement of the Lord Jesus, has covered the sins of each of these Galatians. Not only that, but God, by identifying with the death and resurrection of Jesus, give each believer a new identity, a new I in Christ. That means Christians belong to a new heavenly world. Sanctification is no longer about keeping laws, but rather that because Christians have died with Christ to the law, through the Spirit they live out this new life. Okay, if that all sounds theoretical, maybe check out the Roman videos again. And in any case, there are now Jewish thinking Christians from Jerusalem who have not understood really the Christian's heavenly position and what it means to be in Christ, and they begin to bring Jewish elements back into Christianity. Of course, very subtly and with partial truth. Jesus, or better, Jehoshua, is awesome. Did you know that he was actually a Jew? You know, we know him very well. We can help you, you poor Galatians. Yes, Jesus came for us, Israel. What? For each of you personally? Eh, sorry, you obviously don't know the Old Testament. Oh, you don't even speak Hebrew. But you know what? You can also follow him as your Messiah. What? Christ? Oh, well, that's exactly the same as Messiah. Yes, and Jesus was totally good about the law. The law, I mean, the Torah. 
Not a stroke from the Torah shall pass away. These were his words. It's all right to follow the Torah, and you can't possibly think that anyone who doesn't follow the Torah can get into heaven, right? Snap, the Galatians were now bogged down with the law and lost sight of their heavenly position. But the law brings competition, and competition brings quarrels, and quarrels create class differences, and because of this, the Galatians were a bit of a mess. Of course, you can imagine that the Apostle realized that this is about everything or nothing. This is not a failure of a parishioner or a secondary truth that I will clarify on my next visit. This was about life and death, because when they give up the gospel, it closes the door to heaven. And the first thing the Apostle does is to show who has control of the reins, namely, only the glorified Christ. He was the one who made Paul his apostle, not another man. Second, he shows that he did not receive his gospel teaching from a human being and did not even learn it from a human being. Everything that Paul had learned from his Jewish teacher Gamaliel had helped to persecute the Christian and thus Christ. He had no intention of becoming Christian or knowing anything of this new supposedly anti-Jewish doctrine. And yet it was God's intention. He revealed himself to him and pulled him out of the circulation. Paul spent three years alone with his God in Arabia to drive out his completely false, pharisaic vision. He then spent two weeks in Jerusalem, where he did not visit the churches, and then returned to Syria. The point the Apostle wants to make is this. If you believe that my gospel has Jewish roots, then you have cut yourself. It does not come from the earth, but from heaven. But it is not against the gospel of those from Jerusalem. He shows this in the second chapter. There he goes, again on the basis of revelation from above, to Jerusalem, to the supposedly great apostles, and makes two things clear. My gospel is different in orientation, but the same in substance. Like a coin. It has two sides and is still a single coin. Peter preached the gospel to the Jews and Paul to the non-Jews. So everything is fine. But then Paul shows how he himself corrected Peter when he started to separate himself from the non-Jews out of fear of a certain party of Jews. He consciously takes this example because, first of all, there was hardly any greater authority than Peter for those who were in love with the Jewish doctrines. And second, because it happened in Antioch, which is close to Galatia. So everyone knew that this incident had happened. But what had happened? Peter had been in Antioch, and there he had eaten with all, including the non-Jews. So far, so good, because in the new order in Christ, there is no longer any difference between Jews and Greeks and even Gauls. Peter had to learn that in a blatant way, the worms and so on, you know, read Acts 10 about that. Then some Jewish friends of James had come from Jerusalem and Peter was a little bit embarrassed to eat with the non-Jews. All of a sudden, he's sitting down with his Jewish buddies and has separated himself once again. With this behavior, he has hinted at two things. It's okay to make a distinction between Jews and non-Jews within Christianity. Sometimes it's good to keep the law a bit. And Paul exposed them radically in front of everyone by saying, Peter, why are you not separating yourself when you normally live like a non-Jew? Why this hypocrisy? Either law or grace, either law or Christ. You can't do both. I have died to the law as in Romans 6, and I'm now living in Christ, and Christ lives in me. Okay, that was a lot of stuff. All you have to take away from this video is this. The Galatians were harassed by Jewish thinking Christians to mix a little bit of law into believing in Christ. Paul says, the cocktail does not work and has nothing to do with what I have learned directly from Christ. And in the next video, we will see why this cocktail doesn't mix. So, my take home here is that you have to accept everybody that Jesus loves. God loves everybody, no exemption. But of course, it depends on each one of us because we were given choice. And here, we could see that everything in our life is about God, it's about Jesus. Because if you're nothing, we're, but we have Jesus, then we have everything. 
it's it's very logical you know if you are into logic you know I believe God made everything on earth because it cannot be in random it cannot be haphazard there's an order an order in the universe an order in our body an order of how life begins in conception and we are not a mistake but it all depends on each one of us to put God first in our lives because we know that our lives here are temporary you know each has a longer life each has a, some people have longer lives some have shorter lives but in the end if you believe that we are made of three parts the body the soul and the spirit our body dies it becomes ashes later on but the one that lives is the spirit and the soul because me yeah, I believe in in spirit and in souls because I have seen one I think they make mistakes but anyway uh, it's a long story so if Jesus is equals to all of life then you've got to know him you've got to believe that he is real and he is with us through the Holy Spirit if you believe and believing is not enough you have to put in action we have to nurture it because we will always have challenges even in this uh, uh, chapter Peter was also challenged you know and uh, Peter got uh, even though his faith is strong but sometimes when we get external challenges and pressures we cave in and to the sacrifice of our faith which in the end those pressures are not gonna help you it's your faith is gonna help you in how you live your life when you face God when we face our God So let's accept each others. We have different cultures, we have different and you know like they say what Paul was saying when he was when Peter was with in the with the Gentiles, he was living the Gentile way. But then the most important thing is he was preaching Jesus faith. But then when you had some pressures, eh, you know, you have to cave in and sometimes we forget or we think that, uh, you know, it's okay. Our faith can, can um, cave in. Like an example. Let's see. There's one 
hear it that I did. Uh, living in harmony. I have, um, I have before I had a patient who was trying to challenge me about my faith. I'm a, I'm, I'm a Catholic Christian, and I have, uh, I have. I have a very personal relationship with God, with Jesus, even I know as a child. And I'm glad my parents introduced me to Jesus and I saw their example. And I think I I become a I I'm a good person in Christ. And of course I have my uh, I'm not perfect. And I try, I'm, but I was challenged that uh, he said I have a patient who had, was a Catholic and become a born again Christian, and and I told her it's good if it makes you a better person and you have a personal relationship with Jesus, then it's good. As long as you have faith in Jesus and you put God first, then it's good for you. I said even Paul and Peter have some disagreement. And so, but they are one in Christ. And of course, sometimes we get some challenges, but uh, we try to help each other fall fall back and so it is respect and I have another one you know I was I do attend Bible study before with the born again Protestant and Catholic and there's, you know, but there was one time where I was challenged that uh, I was invited to attend a full gospel business man's meeting. I think I attended twice. But what I really take home there is a lot of times they bash the Catholic well I you know that's their prerogative but you know, I just keep quiet I stood my ground and then uh, but one time the one who invites me told me why are you still attending Catholic mass the priests are are sinful they are you know I told her you know, instead of uh, criticizing them, why don't you pray for them? Just not only priests, pastors, ministers, min uh, missionaries, because we're all human. And I told her, if there, if there, are probably be you and me, there's like two or three devils who's trying to tempt us with priests, nuns, missionaries, um, pastors, there are probably ten or more trying to pull them, tempt them. And so we have to pray for all of them because they put their lives um, dedicated focus on bringing souls to Jesus. And those are not easy. They are very hard. You just have to have a conviction. So instead of criticizing, you know, bashing and trying to, uh, the, you know, my, my, 
my way of life is about it's better than you or things like that let's accept each other and you know in there's one parable when when this the the apostles were trying to stop somebody who's casting out demons who are not who doesn't belong to their group their you know disciple around Jesus and they were trying to stop him and what did Jesus say don't stop him if they're not against you they are for you so let's focus on on winning souls to Jesus have faith in Jesus and don't try to rock the foundation of of others just because you want are we are we in a uh, competition we are we should be in competition with the evil one not against each other and try to to put them in the right track So it's it's really very challenging to love all people in Jesus' name, it's especially if there's some you call deplorables, and sometimes it's not far; it's in your environment, it's in your family even if in yourself you have to love yourself and ask the Holy Spirit always it's free though Jesus gave send the Holy Spirit to be an advocate because he knows it's hard God knows it's hard but that's why we need the Holy Spirit all the time. And sometimes it's hard to bite our tongue, especially if we're uh, being challenged. And it's hard to bite, uh, to control our emotions. Even though you're angry, there's a way, you know, there's a way of saying things. Sometimes it's not what we say that hurts people, it's how we say it. It's how we say it. And like uh, even with your children, with your family, you know, it's how you live in harmony and sometimes you cannot be too pushy you just have to plant a seed and pray for that person and a lot of times you just have to let the Holy Spirit work on them so you have to pray for them instead of criticizing them in God's time and in God's way, you and the Holy Sp and the other person would have some chains of mindset, you know. And whoever the Holy Spirit uh, prompt to take the first step of reconciliation. Or of understanding of of love as it does me you know I, I've been, been telling over and over again about when my husband and I are quarreling and sometimes you know because here in the States the divorce is so uh, easy especially in Las Vegas is there's even a drive-through 
but and I pray and the Lord speaks to me that divorce is not an option for me why do I look for a perfect husband when I'm not perfect myself and there are times when the Lord tells me to do the move do the first step of reconciliation to step on my pride so it's the same the way the same thing try to listen to the Holy Spirit try to listen because and then like said our right hand of fellowship Because with Christ equals love. I like this, all this uh, artwork. They are they are available in the internet. And this one, with Christ, there's everybody's equal. So let's be justified by faith in Christ. Let's have faith. Let's put God, Jesus Christ first. It's always you ask, what will Jesus do if he's in my situation? Will Jesus be displeased or pleased with me? That's for me. That's my always my my question all the time. If he's pleased or displeased with me. So let's have. Christ live in us. It says here, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in us. It's hard. It's not easy. It's not easy. But we need to if not easy here on earth that for sure will be awarded for eternal life with him so we have to be still God is with us and help is on the way I like this you know? and we just have to ask the Holy Spirit for all these fruits there's so much and he knows what's what we need at that time we always ask for all of them let's ask for everything for in the end our mission is to glorify God by by Christ living in us we basically um, spreading the gospel through our lives as we continuously grow and bring people to Christ so let's end this I want to pray in the name Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen in your name Lord Jesus Christ I bind all I take authority and I bind all powers and forces in the air and the ground in the water on the ground netherworld nature in fire in men in microorganisms you are the lord over the entire universe and i give you the glory for your creation in your name lord jesus christ i bind all demonic forces all negativity all mountains obstacles infection illness sickness strife family division curse confusion darkness anger strife everything that's negative that is not to your liking lord that have come against all human beings even the unborn especially my family my friends my relatives acquaintances and even my enemies and all our relatives And those souls in purgatory or souls that have passed before us and all those who are in prison, 
physically, mentally, and spiritually. Cover us with your precious blood that was shed for us on the cross. Mary, our mother, we seek your protection this session with the sacred heart of Jesus for us and our family. Surround us with your mantle of love to scar its enemy. Saint Michael, our guardian angel, come defend us and our family against the evil ones that roam the earth. In your mighty name, Lord Jesus Christ, I bind and command all the powers and forces of evil to depart right now from everybody away from us, our homes and our lands. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your faithful and compassionate God. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts with thy holy gifts. Let our weaknesses be penetrated with thy strength this very day, that we may fulfill all our duties concessionally, that we may do what is right and just. Let our charity be such as to offend no one, hurt no one's feelings, so generous a part in sincerely any wrong done to us. Assist us, O Holy Spirit, in all the trials of light, life. Enlighten us in our ignorance, advice in our doubts. Strengthen us in our weaknesses. Help us in all need and embarrassment. Protect us in temptations. Can console us in afflictions. Graciously hear us, O Holy Spirit, and pour thy light into our hearts, our soul, and mind. Assist us to live a holy life and to grow in goodness and grace. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, with thy light, with thy grace, with thy strength, with thy consolation, with thy charity, that you may be made worthy to live a life of holy love. Amen. God bless us all. Good night. And uh, let's try to be like Christ. And please don't forget to subscribe and share. Thank you. God bless us.